Hey there, Scott here from Social Energy Presents, and thanks again for joining us. We've got a fantastic episode for you today featuring Miles Goodwin, an internationally acclaimed Canadian singer, guitarist, writer, and producer, perhaps best known as the founder of the band April Wine. Miles led the band from its initial formation into becoming a multi-platinum award-winning group. Miles is also the only original member since its inception back in 1969. Miles received the prestigious East Coast Music Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008 and the Society of Composers, Authors, and Music Publishers of Canada's National Achievement Award in 2002. In 2016, he released his memoir named Just Between You and Me, which became an instant bestseller on the Globe and Mail's nonfiction list. His second book, Elvis and Tiger, a fiction, was published in 2018 and has also been very well received. The Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues recording, which was released in 2018, earned international acclaim as well as a Juno nomination for Blues Recording of the Year in 2019. And today, Miles joins us from his home for an intimate look back at the successes in his career and to bring us up to speed on what he's working on next. So sit back, relax, and get ready as Social Energy now presents you with your Backstage Pass. tell you one thing it's really nice to see you in a place other than the air canada lounge <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I'm, whenever i'm on tour with randy because i play with randy backman and, and oh when, whenever i'm on tour it's like i seem to run into you guys in the lounge somewhere <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> that, that's the, that's the thing about what we do you know we uh, we see each other in airports and backstage and things like that typically uh I think that when I leave this business, that the retire, that the one thing I'm going to miss the most is not seeing old friends. Because if I'm not on the road, I won't see them again. You know. I know. Interesting. You know, yeah. it's it's funny because I have such a, a deep history with you that you don't even know about. And one of the reasons being is that um, <clears throat> April Wine, I, my hometown was Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Yeah. When you guys came through Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, it was like the Beatles were coming you know, to us guys. And you were the first band I ever saw with smoke bombs and mirror balls and things like that. And I remember, what was it? What was your opening song? Mama, um, da -da 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 -da. oh, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and it was great because it had that great pro one and you hear jerry smoke bombs and yeah i think i think it's called mummy you know it's true i think is what it calls that's yeah shuffle yeah and yeah it was and it was a great opening and of course the first time i'd ever seen anything like that in my life like the only thing up until that time, I remember seeing on a, a the Doobie Brothers what once were what once vices are now habits album cover, and I saw a smoke on the stage. I'm like, gee, I wonder what that is. And then I go to see you guys shortly after I saw that album cover, and all of a sudden, kaboom, <laughs> it's gone. Yeah. It was awesome. And then you know, and I couldn't figure out how those mirror balls worked. I'd never seen one before in my life. You know, it's the right. same re, we don't see anything, you know. Yeah, I hear you. And I thought yeah. I thought there was actually a light inside those balls that was making them work. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was the spotlights shining on them because it. Yeah. Was, you you guys had a really good crew. It was a it was a top notch show. Yeah, it was back when you didn't need a, a license too for the uh, for all of that. The pyro. Yeah, the pyro. It just oh. it, you did whatever you wanted to do, and yeah. so it was kind of dangerous what we did. Yeah. Had the flash pots running across the stage and. The mirror balls, because they're fine. Strobe lights on Jerry when he does his uh, yeah. famous da, 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 da stuff. Um, Probably one of the best drum solos ever. Yeah, because he's very musical. And the um, the canon that we had, we introduced with the album Stand Back in 75, yeah. was a real working canon. Yeah. And, you know, that was it was built for us, but it did fire confetti into the audience. And it, we used dynamite and a fuse and the whole thing, you know. Um, so we had to be very careful that nothing ever was put in there on purpose by action, maybe a Coke bottle or a nail or, you know, rocks, somebody were trying to be real, uh, real nasty about it. So, you know, we had to be very careful with the can. That was probably the most dangerous piece of pyro that we had, uh, yeah. firing a can, firing a can into an audience. 
And the confetti, of course, would catch on fire. It would just float down over the audience, the yeah. front half, you know, sparking and everything else. And people would kind of be patting them out when they landed on their hair, on their shoulders. <laughs> I remember when we put Shabba together, we were on the road and we wanted to increase our sort of show of, and we had a friend of ours build us some flash pots. And so because we were playing cabarets at the time, we didn't want the, the flash pots to be run by our sound man at the back because he wouldn't see if there was people dancing on the stage so what we have is a foot switch on the stage so we could make sure, sure not, to, yeah. not to put them off in case there was somebody standing over them yeah you can do that yeah well then the fo foot switch shorted out one day and i was uh, it was just we were doing a sock hop for seeing some, some young kids the middle of the afternoon in medicine hut alberta and so I, I i'm there and i'm fiddling and I, I i think i've got it figured out you know so i i put the wire around the two poles and all the stuff, and I poured the gunpowder on. And I'm going, okay, great. And then we had these big old soup canisters that we'd put over the top of them so that it wouldn't shoot this way, left and right, out. And as I put the can over like this, it shorted out and blew up in my face. I burned all my hair off, my eyebrows, eyelashes, and all I could hear. And I had my eyes closed because I, you know, I didn't want to open my eyes in case I was blind. It was like a major explosion. And all I could hear was kids crying everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it was like I, the worst way to start a sock hop ever. Yeah, I, I know that's happened to other people. I've heard that kind of story before. It's eyebrows gone, part of the hair, you know. Yeah. Now, getting back to that 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 era, because it's real special to me. I hope you don't mind. But what kind of gear, you guys, I remember you were playing, I think it was like a melody maker? Or was that an old? Yeah, Muscat? I I know that that's my melody maker, which I still have. Um it's a 62, I think, Melody Maker wow. that I bought in Cape Breton in 1968. I traded it actually for um, uh, a Hagstrom. Is that right? Yeah, a bit of a Sputnik. I have little switches on it up and down and um, a red one. And I traded even for that Gibson. That was the first Gibson I ever had. Uh, I changed the pickups on it. Um, and I used it for years. Well, I remember Gary Moffat had one too. I think you guys almost almost looked like matching guitars. No, you no, you never, he never had, had a. You never had one. Never. Well, what he had, he had Gibson TV model, I guess, for lack of a better. I forget exactly what it's called. Double cutaway. They call it a TV model. It was oh, white okay. or light colored, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, he Gary had some great guitars, but my guitar was stolen. I think Randy Bachman got one back a while ago. I know. Uh, yeah. I know um, uh, the other fellow there, Peter Frampton did. Mm -hmm. And before this happened about five years ago, my guitar was supposedly destroyed in a trucking accident in Montreal to carry. And there's a person, a friend of mine said, yeah, I saw it in pieces and everything. So it disappeared and, and it was my favorite guitar. It's the only guitar I used. When I didn't have a hundred, I have a hundred now, but I had one and that was it. And, um, Anyway, uh, four years ago or five years ago, I got it back on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, I got a message on Facebook saying, I know where your melody maker is. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> yes, I do. It's in the West Coast. A guy has it in his house. And it's been sitting in his house for at least 15 years. And somebody before him and somebody before him. And anyway, I contacted the guy and I said, can you show me a picture? And it was my guitar. It's very unique because I customized it pick guard, everything looked completely different than any other one on the planet. I said, that's mine. I want, I'd love to have it back. Now, I could have called the police because it's stolen. Mm -hmm. If someone steals your car and then you see it in a driveway, you call the police. They'll come and say, show me the registration, you know. Gotcha. But I just said to the guy, I said, you know what? I want my guitar back. I'll buy it back. Because I couldn't believe that my precious guitar was still alive and well. And that was Christmas Eve. So that was quite a story. And I, I it was in my hands within a week uh, and I had to buy it. That was OK. And I it was the news everywhere. It was all over the news. I had television people in my house for for about four days. I was doing this minute as you know, this hour is 22 minutes. I was doing interviews everywhere. It was such a feel good story. You know, it's Christmas. People yeah. want a story that feels good. Yeah. Christmas Eve, my, I made the guitar has been gone 30 years and it's back. So that guitar downstairs, downstairs, and it never leaves the house, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, well and, you, and you, it's amazing, well, the par parallel universes, you were talking about what happened with Randy. Yeah. And, I, and some guy, it was weird, some guy had some sort of 
AI software, his computer, where he's actually going and he just took it upon himself to start looking for Randy's guitar to see if he can find it. Yeah, he, that's the story. Yeah. Yeah. And he even got, well, and I've got that guy now on a search for my guitars. And I'll probably, they'll probably never be found. I've got three guitars that I would love to get it back. But, yeah. I've got, I've got a dozen at least I'd love to have back. But yeah. Now, getting back to guitars. So you said you have quite a collection now. Now, did, on the cover of Electric Jewels, there was a cartoon. Did you own that guitar that, that you cartooned? That's that yeah. That's that's yeah. The, oh, you see the picture on the back. Uh, that, real, that's what I picture. thought. Okay, that's what I thought because I remember that as a kid. Was that one of those Italian Goyas or something? Or? It's a it, yeah. It's a it's a Goya from the sixties. Uh, you know, I have two. Uh, if I have any iconic guitars at all associated with April Wine, there is uh, the red one you're talking about, the red sparkle Goya, which of course I still have. Actually, it's in a Hall of Fame uh, on display right now. But the uh, that one and my one I just talked about, my Melody Maker, and and I have another guitar, um, I, um, a '77 artist and two that's pretty well known everywhere. Uh, I mean, even on eBay, um, I'll go on eBay, uh, not very often, hardly, but there was a time a number of years ago where there's a guitar just like my Red Sparkle guitar in an open case with April wine albums stacked up around it. And this was, this what he was trying to sell my, you know, saying this was my guitar. Wow. Uh, and it wasn't, I got a hold of him. I said, you know that, you know, that's not my guitar. I have my guitar. You get rid of that immediately. And it was gone like that. But, and that was in the States. That was a guy in the States. So it, it's very, very well known and referred to as the April wine guitar, if you will, that same red sparkle guitar went from the album, electric jewels. Yeah. Wow. It, yeah, because I, I, that that whole era, and then of course, um, that was right around the time when you guys came out, and it, it was a cover, I'm on fire for you. Yeah. Now, now who, who wrote that one? Was that a friend of yours? No, no, it was a guy named John Wright, an American. Because I remember when it came out, and once again, I'm going back to like how innocent it was, I just heard uh, Dark Side of the Moon. Like probably, so, oh, 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 okay, Dark Side of the Moon, yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm talking about the uh, you know the Pink Floyd album. Yeah, of course. And and I'm hearing that, and I when I first heard that song, I went, oh wow, Pink Floyd has a new song out, because it's it just had it, you I, you were using phase shifters on the guitars, which was fairly recent stuff, and mm -hmm. of course uh, it was I think it was Gary that was playing the slide stuff on it, and it was very. Yeah, the slides the slide stuff that that song was for a uh, a uh, a brief signing with a record label um doug morris was the was the president of that label I'm trying to think of what it was called he went on to become president of uh, bmi or one of the majors i forget which one it's a long time ago but we're in the studio and doug morris is there with his partner we're doing on fire for you in the u.s no he came up to toronto we did toronto and he said uh, i want a i want a hawaiian guitar solo and i said hawaiian guitar he goes, yeah, can you play Hawaiian guitar? I, I, I said, hang on a sec. I went out and I, Gary was in the live room and I said, can you bring a slide with you? Because he wants Hawaiian. Can you just do some sl a slide solo? So he said, sure. And he did it. So that's what the solo is. He's doing these slide things as the president of the record label, um, you know, thought would be a Hawaiian guitar would sound good on the record. It's a lovely track, which gets back to your production. I think your production skills are amazing. You've always had a real knack of getting, you, ha you have a, a particular sound. Your guitars are always thick, they sustain, they, they, they're never abrasive. They're, they're, they always sound sweet with that without sounding ever wimpy. They're in your face. You, you've, mm. you've got a really good ear for, for production. Thank you. you know, for most of our time, we used uh, Marshalls. You did, huh? Yeah, yeah, mostly it's Marshalls. We all, we all played Marshalls. Gary and I played Marshalls. Brian Greenway joined us in 77. So he, he also played Marshalls. In the early years, we played Fender. We played um, we played uh, some trainers for a while, you know, various things. When I left the Maritimes with my beloved Melody Maker, I was through and playing through a Fender basement. Right. Uh, a silver Which I still bass. wish I had. <laughs> I have I have I have one downstairs, the blonde, blonde one from the early 60s, uh, oh, a beautiful. whole the two piece. Yeah. Uh, it is beautiful. And the and I was playing for speakers. I used two PA trainer PA columns. Oh. So these two tall PA columns are not very wide, only about like 
I guess they had twelves, but maybe even tens. And there were two of them, and and my and my head, and I had a sound. I had a very distinctive sound. And uh, down here in Nova Scotia, where I'm from and where I am now, uh, where we started off, everybody knew me for my sound, and they were all like really liked the sound that I had. It was thick and it was creamy and it sustained and everything. And of course, I, I got rid of all of that uh, eventually. But Marshalls mostly is what we use. Although right now I'm into Vox big time. But it's only in Marshalls, yeah. But I mean, it doesn't matter. You give me, a, you give somebody an amplifier and a guitar and they'll sound the same, you know, because they have their go-to sound, right? Oh, that's too bright for my ears. I'm going to just darken that. And I want some more snot on there and I want a little more sustain there. That's the sound I like. And it sounds like everything else he does. Mostly, right? I did a gig with Don Felder and uh, they, they he had a backline strat they gave him. Uh, uh, a, 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 a What the hell? The uh, Ibanez Tube Screamer and a Fender Deluxe Amp, all out of Long and McQuaid. And we do go to this gig and we started playing Hotel California. I'm like, Jesus Christ, there's the sound. It's all in the mm. fingers, isn't it? You know, it's, yeah, it's, I, the way you dial something in and in the hands. Yeah, yeah. No, ab absolutely. And, you know, somebody that thinks they're going to buy a Stevie Ray guitar and sound like Stevie is like it's ridiculous, you know, but um, yeah, yeah, you, you know, you find your sound and, and then you play it and there it is. It's all there, whether it's Joe Walsh or me or you or the next guy. Right. It's kind of we sound like we do. I got to ask you a question. This is like more on a, on a more personal level. Uh, do you remember a guy named way back, way, way back, a guy named Sean Wilson? No. No, because Sean Wilson is a is a, a brother in law of the drummer in my first professional band, Shama. You actually saw Shama a few times uh, back in the day. You actually approached us one time on possibly wanting to produce an album with us. But really, was, says who? Sask says who? <laughs> no, no, seriously. We, we, I'm not interested. We, I've never been interested in producing anybody but myself and April Wine. Although I had, I did done one or two things just for special reasons, but. I don't remember your band or ever going to you saying I want to produce you. But, yeah, well, what was, possible? but it, was it two o'clock in the morning in a bar? <laughs> it's possible. We, that we, would make sense. We were playing the A4 Club in Saskatoon and you came down and you said, maybe you didn't say produce, but you said something about maybe wanting to do something with us. Maybe you figured, maybe you had an affiliate with Aquarius, whatever at the time, and you wanted to maybe bring us there. Well, I, I don't remember. But if you say so, I'm not disagreeing. I, I just don't remember. Yeah, oh, I know. Yeah, it's, it, it, this that stuff happens a million times. But the day. name sounds familiar. The Shamus or Shama. We used to dress Shama. all in. We used to dress all in white, and it was like Angel. You know the band Angel. We had. We had. It was quite a production. We there was a. Good, there was, was a, a really band. Good band. There was a band way back in Quebec called the Class Cells. I think they were called, and they were all in white, and they had the big white coiffed hair. They were wigs, obviously, because they were all the same. Oh. And that's back, there was a time way back in the, in maybe even the, uh, sorry, I need these to see properly the distance, uh, is um, uh, in the 50s, a lot of bands dressed up, didn't they? Way before Kiss. I know my cousin who inspired me to play uh, a guitar quite a bit. He, uh, he was in a band called The Interns, Sonny and the Interns. And they all dressed like interns in a hospital. And, and, and all the groups back then were being very silly that way. Um, uh, and that's uh, that's before the Beatles. Oh, there, there was there was a band out here. This would have been still actually early '80s, maybe late '70s. They're called the Berry Cup Blues Band, a really good band, but yeah. absolute nutballs. And they would they went up on stage and they would dress up as nurses, you know, with their hairy legs and all this stuff, and just like crazy guys. <laughs> but what they what they did is that they didn't have a light show. What they did was they had a whole bunch of lamps, house lamps and stuff on the oh. stage. And so if the keyboard player was doing a solo, he'd go up, pull the cord and the lamp would go on, he'd play a solo and he'd turn it oh, off. I like, I, like, I like that, yeah. <laughs> it was great. Yeah, I, I think there were a few groups. I remember Zappa, when he did an intermission during his show, at one, one tour anyway, they would just sit around a table like they were in a kitchen. <laughs> and, and just ignore the audience. They sit there and have their tea and have their conversations, and they were done. They get up from the dining room, the kitchen table, and plug in and play. But that's cool. Yeah, uh, what a guy, Zappa. Have you read his autobiography? It's called the real, <laughs> the real Thanks Zappa book. It's absolutely I, astounding. Yeah. yeah, I bet it is. He was a genius. Yeah, yeah. I read I'll... yours, by the way. I oh, read okay. it. Uh, I read it probably five, six years ago. I thought it was a great book. 
Yeah, thank you. That was, I forget, yeah, it was five or six years ago. Yeah, probably you, or six. You lived for a while, was it in Bermuda or something like that? In the Bahamas. Bahamas. Yeah, it sounded like you had a, a nice thing going on there. Oh, I loved it there. I loved it there. And there was some, somebody reminded me yesterday of some people that lived in the Bahamas at the same time. I was trying to think who it was. They got the talking heads, the husband and wife and the talking heads. I used to run into them all the time down there. Uh, Robert Palmer lived there, and Robert was Robert and I were good friends. And um, what a great singer! Yeah, a lot of feel. And and when I was doing what else was I doing down there at uh, at the studio in, uh, in the West End? Um, he anyway, he was doing "Addicted to Love" that album, right? And I was doing another album, and Julio Iglesias was doing another record. Wow! <laughs> and uh, yeah, I used to play shoot a little, little pool with uh, with Julio and have have lunch with him every now and then. But Robert and I were friends. And, all right. So so you were doing a solo album. I don't. You didn't record an April Wine album down there, did you? I did one called Walking Through Fire. Uh, oh, okay. uh, Walking Through Fire. Or animal, animal, yeah, Walking Animal Grace. I think it was. And anyway, yeah, because I was done with April Wine and I left April Wine in '84. And uh, contractually owed them one more album. You probably know how that goes. You know, right. you owe us another one. Right. And I said, okay. So I went to the Bahamas. I asked Brian to come down and, and I wrote some songs and I recorded the last April Wine studio album at that time um, at the same studio. Um, Brian's a really good guy. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. He really is. He's a real, he's a real saint, that boy. He's, he's got a really nice disposition about him. Yeah. Um, I've met him a few times too at the Arcana kind of Lounge and he's always been more than gracious. Yeah, um, I, with with Robert Palmer though, a good story about Robert is that we had just been for a swim and we're down at his place and we came in and uh, we both smoked cigarettes as I recall at that time. Yeah, he smoked he smoked a lot and uh, anyway, and we were having a short glass of a scotch and uh, and it was uh, the weekend. It was probably a Friday, and yeah, so he said I'm going to New York tomorrow to do a video. And we talked about how we hated doing videos because he was very shy and, and, and I am too. And, um, and I said, yeah, I agree with you. You know, we're, we're musicians, we're singers, songwriters, we're not actors, but we have to because of MTV, you know, we, we, all of a sudden we're pushed in front of a camera and we got to pretend and stuff. He said, yeah, I hate it. And he said, yeah, oh, well, good luck with that. And he did Addicted to Love that weekend, right. which is one of the most famous. Oh yeah, <laughs> iconic video. He went down there and he's, you know, his Mr. Class, the way he dresses and his moves and the, the singing is just so spectacular. And obviously the, the director had a great idea with the girls all dressed up, dancing together and stuff. So yeah. it was, yeah, it was no, very, was a, very cool. That was a really great video. I, yeah. um, can I talk to you about a song? Um, Say Hello. That's yeah. probably one of the most innovative songs I've ever heard on the radio. Hmm. Thank like you. how how did how did that song come about? I mean, it's just got such a a backwards not backwards but just a, an incredibly different groove that works so well, and yeah. the guitars. And I was going to ask you one thing about the guitars, if you don't mind. Were those guitars plucked or were they slapped? You know, don't don't da da don't da da don't. Neither, don't. neither. Because it almost sounds like you're playing them with a drumstick. You know, they they, they yeah. attack on them. Yeah. Uh, well, now when you play it live, I put a little bit of chorus on it, and uh, it's more like a plucking muted, you know, like that. And it works. Yeah, I'm talking about that breakdown part. Yeah. Yeah, that's that. It just sounded to me like, geez, is he slapping the strings with a stick or no, something? Because it was no. such an interesting sound. No. If you're talking about the breakdown right before the solo, like this big, thick guitar in your face, that was Gary Moffat. Les Paul, probably not a, a same double cutaway Les Paul TV model uh, through a Marshall, almost certainly. Uh, but no, it's very interesting that song because I was a drummer a million years ago uh, when I was very, very young. And so I, when I write, I always like to, you know, I'm always conscious of, of tempo and time and grooves and things like that. Uh, the beat in that song is very unusual. I still don't know what it is. I think it's a six, nine or something. But I, I, I discovered that I wrote that part, that whole drum beat. And uh, I took it to Jerry. And I said, Jerry, can you play this, please? So he did. 
And he said, that's really different. So he got really comfortable with it, you know, just kind of tweaked it, massaged it a bit. And then uh, what we did is we recorded the song. I mean, I wrote the song. And the thing about the, the magic about this song is that the drumming is complicated. It is. I've heard drummers try to play it and they never hardly no, ever get it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not simple. No, it's very complicated. And, and, and the fact that I came up with it is like, like, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but anyway, <laughs> uh, none. <laughs> and so, so, so the thing of what's cool about it is it's the same chords all the time. They never change. It's like a loop. It's, it, 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 yeah. You play, you know, it's not a loop, but you play it like it. It's three chords, whether it's the verse, whether it's the chorus, whether it's the solo, it never changes. I just play it different ways, but it never changes. Well, it's like you, it was like almost, it's almost like that song predates what made you two famous. Cause they do that. They'll have the same chords going over and over again and becomes the chorus, it becomes the bridge, it becomes the verse and all that sort of stuff. And that's what you did with that song. I've done that a, lot, a number of times, but anyway, on this particular song. So then I, I'm working in the studio. That's when we moved from, um, that's when we moved into uh, Le Studio, owned by more, up in Moore Nights, by, owned by um, Andre Perry. And there were two engineers at the time. It was Paul Northfield, who did a lot of work with Rush, because Rush worked up there. And there was Nick Blagona. And Nick was, 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 was the chief engineer, and he was doing this record. And he said, Miles, please come to the studio. You know, because I was working in Temple Studios for a number of, for quite some time to come out to the Laurentians and, and work. And so I did. So when we got to that song, what he did, he said, okay, play your parts, play your da, 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 but do it, do it a note at a time. And I've done this many times. It's a secret to Queen sound too. Uh, when you hear those big orchestral guitars, you just say there's four notes in your, in your chord then you, you triple track the first note, then you triple track the second note, all on different tracks. And then you mix them. And it's very, very, very different from playing them together. Completely a different world. They're orchestrated. Yes, you and said then, it exactly right. And then they triggered it through, um, I think it was a hi-hat pattern. We, we played a pattern, so it, something like that. And so when he played it, the guitars were duh, 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 duh. So they had that percolating sound ah. that you're thinking was plucked or, or whatever, however, you know. Oh, so it was a gate? It was a gate. Ah. It was a gate set just a certain way. And it was either, yeah, I think it's a hi-hat or use a click track just to trigger the gate. So non-musicians might not understand, but I know you do what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so that created that. And then the genius of that man went even further. God bless him, he passed away, rest in peace, a few years ago. Uh, what he did is he took Steve Lang's bass, rest in peace, he passed a while, away, a while ago. Yeah, too. I remember hearing about that. So anyway, uh, so he took Steve's wonderful bass track and he just went at it. He just edit, 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 all of this, all of a sudden these holes, hesitations and all this. He created a bass track that every bass player goes, what is that? You know, how did he, how do you play that? And of course we do it now when everybody has to learn what Nick created, which was very, very bizarre. So if you have this bizarre bass track with these gated guitars, all recorded individuals notes with a drum beat that nobody really knows what the timing is, you put that all together with a very simple melody. Yeah. We'll go living in the past. I believe the love should last, you know, very simple. And I sang it with Elvis in mind, you know, because I didn't think it was the kind of song that should be belted out. And so I, you know, I sang a little bit low and I don't sound like Elvis, but it was in my mind. Won't go living in the past. It's kind of a low vocal for me. Right. And then the chords are all the same, all the same, all the same, all the same, all the same. We just we just arranged the different parts. But I've been doing that forever. I think the first time I might have done that was a song called Tonight's a Wonderful Night to Fall in Love. Right. From years ago, where da da ba ba da da ba da da da. It's all solo, same chorus, same verse, same. Yeah. Simple. Uh, another song I did it with. Oh, wait, wait, let me hold you there. Did I not read in your book that that song was one of a very early song that you wrote that you revisited later? No, no. Which one that, was it? I wrote a song in high school in a in a in a school band 
cover band called Woody's Termites. And the song is You Won't Dance With Me. You Won't Dance With Me. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. I had it wrong. Okay. No, I wrote, I wrote Tonight's a Wonderful Night to Fall in Love. And the song called Wouldn't Want to Lose Your Love. A uh, piano song. Wouldn't want to lose your love. Yeah, beautiful. And I took those to New York and I worked with Gene... Um, uh, Gene Cornish and Dino Donnelly from the from the Rascals. I just talked with Felix. Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know Felix. I know Dino, and I know um, I know Gene. Well, Gene was from Canada. He was originally from Canada. Yeah. Yeah. And of yeah. course, Donnelly is a he's a New Yorker through and through. The drummer. And what a, and what a drummer. Yeah, and, and a sweetheart. Um, and so they say, come down to New York, New York, because they recorded an album in Mon in Halifax called April Wine Live. We recorded at a high school and they wanted to work with April Wine. So they recorded that and that was our very first live album. And the Melody Maker, of course, is all over it. So anyway, um, they said, well, let's do a studio. Album. Can you write me a couple of songs? Write us a couple of songs and come on down to New York. And it was like this. It was, it was moving very fast. I said, sure. So I wrote, tonight's a wonderful night to fall in love and I wouldn't want to lose your love. And it went down and we recorded that in New York. Um, those two songs. That's just an aside. I just wanted to mention that. I, I wouldn't want to lose song. your love. I, we actually did that song with Shama. Oh yeah, did you? Oh yeah, I love that tune. A really good one. Yeah, uh, that you see, I wrote that on piano. I don't write too much with piano. With the, with this particular, you know, the thing is, I bought a piano after hearing Elton John. Elton John came on, changed every, you know, a lot of people's lives. Did mine, you know, like some. I was suddenly sometimes an artist will come along and, that's so different, and you love them for what they do. Which brings me and, to the next question. Yeah. Like you, you, the first time I heard "Bad Side of the Moon," of course, was you. What a what a great freaking song! <laughs> Elton the way John, you guys approached it was incredible. Well, what a, yeah, Elton John song. song. Hmm. And so, anyway, um, uh, uh, oh yeah, so Elton John. So I got a piano for free, and I moved it into our little band house. And I, my rationalization was like, I want to play something on the piano. If I can write a hit on this piano, that'll be all worthwhile, right? Right. So I would, I wrote, wouldn't want to lose your love, which was in Canada a hit. Mm -hmm. So that was really nice. But I don't write on piano very much. I also wrote uh, um, like a lover, like a song, which oh, yeah. is a little, a little more complicated, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I wrote um, uh, a hard, harder song. Did it with Nick called. Um, Rock and Roll's a vicious game. Oh yeah, yeah. But once, and, but once again, it was done almost in a love song sort of feel, wasn't it? Not really. Uh, which which one? Um, rock, rock and Roll's a vicious, vicious game. Oh no, no. I was I, I was I, I always thought that that's uh, yeah that song always struck me as a love song with different lyrics. I don't know why. <laughs> well, maybe because it's slow, but yeah. it gets real heavy. Like you. You know, the lyrics are like, he rocked his way through yesterday, thought he had a chance, play guitar and wrote some songs, sang some songs of love and romance, something like that. Did a share of traveling like a dog without a bone, a fugitive who would rather give, uh, something without a home or something, something like that. Pretty heavy lyrics. Right. Because I was thinking about Elvis. And then I started thinking about Janice. And then I started thinking about Jimmy and all of these people that succumbed to the lifestyle. Right. But then more important to my heart was that I wrote it for the guy and the gal that loves music more than anything. And they want to be uh, successful. They want to be a star, you know, and and people with more talent than I have um, don't make it. And it's heartbreaking, you know, if we, because there's a lot of luck and all the rest of it. You know how it is. A lot of hard, hard work. Yeah. And um, and I wrote that for fan people that wanted to be a musician and there's a rock and roll's a vicious game and then ba -da, ba -da, really heavy guitars come in and, it's, and then i start dropping beats in the bridge and i sing really high and it becomes urgent and and so it's not a love song at all but the the critics at the time said oh it's good when he's it's sour grapes you know because they didn't they haven't broken through the u.s and so even though they're you know very well known up here and, and everything else. We had to break the U.S., and uh, which which we, which we did at that time. Um, I remember you guys getting quite a bit of press in the states for the whole world's going crazy, though. The whole world's going crazy. The whole because I, mean, I remember I remember an article in Circus Magazine at the time or Cream, one or the other, about the kiss of the North. And it was you guys. 
because you were oh, because okay. you guys are bringing that big watchman guy on the on tour and uh, i remember i remember i was on the road in grand prairie alberta and went to see you guys with heart warming you up yes that's right uh, you're talking about the mad hatter mad hatter talking? pardon me yes the yeah. mad hatter on stage the big mache character yeah. yeah yeah that was that was a lot of fun well that was the time we were doing the canon and then after the canon, which was Stand Back, which is my favorite April One album. Yeah, that was a great, great album. I love that album. And so after Stand Back, then, of course, it was, um, uh, I think it was Electric Jules or the Mache. Uh, the whole was going crazy. That's right. The Mad yeah. Hatter. And, and then, uh, you know, the, the, we talked about the pyro and the flashes and the bombs and the, and the, the black lights. Uh, the, 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 I had a guitar. I still have it downstairs. One of, I, I've had it for like ever. I had it since it was hair to my tits, you know, and and uh, wearing Nova Scotia plaid jackets and, and pumps like this, ridiculous. Uh, that long. Um, it's downstairs. <laughs> it, it's it's downstairs, and uh, it weighs nothing. And it's an SG that's sweet as sound. Oh my god, it's so sweet. It's it so high, and it just sings every time. I've used it on my blues records, my recent blues records. I've used it with April Wine forever. And they painted the knobs in a day glow paint. And then we got day glow lights and the dots and everything. So all of a sudden we go black and just a day glow light. And it was just a guitar would be floating around on stage while I played it. You know, that was during that time. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. Talking well, about the, the Stand Back album. I mean, it, there's a lot of hotels right now that are cursing you guys for all the uh, fire bells that were stolen for drummers to do a cover of Who What a Night. <laughs> yeah. Who What a Night. Yeah. Yeah. I bet you there are. Yeah. I know because we did. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just saw an interview. Somebody sent me uh, the, the hockey commentator. What's his name? The famous one. Uh, oh, Don. Um, yeah, not, not, not Don Cherry. His uh, no. his partner. Ron. Ron. Yeah. Ron McLean. Yeah. Ron McLean. I just said they sent me a video the last two or three days. People sent me a video saying, oh, look, Rains, he's talking about April Wine and the first show he ever saw. And who would a night in the bell and everything? You know? Yeah, he was from Red Deer. Was he from Red Deer? Yeah, he was from Red Deer. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he's 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 quite a good guy. I've met him on a few occasions. He's a very nice guy. Just he seems to be a nice man. Yeah, yeah, he's he's not. He, it's not a put on. He's actually that good. But yeah, no, that um, and and of course Jim Clench. We lost him too. You know. Yeah, um, we did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I I remember seeing Jim after April Wine when he uh, for a period he was actually in the early stages of Lover Boy. Yeah, he was with uh, BTO, wasn't he? Uh, he was with BTO. Uh, uh, BTO, I think, happened after Loverboy. Uh, he was actually with Loverboy okay. for a bit. Yeah, then, that rings a bell. Yeah. Yeah, and then he went with BTO when uh, Randy had left. And uh, yeah. they, they brought him in and Fred went to guitar and they did an album. Uh, Jim, yeah. Jim Valance produced it. I remember that. Yeah. Rock and, yeah. Rock and, rock and Roll Nights, I think it was called. Yeah, I don't know, but you know, I, I was thinking at the time, well, good for Jim. Yeah, yeah. But it just didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that 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 there's that's the thing is that you guys, well, and especially you being the head honcho of that band, the band wouldn't have existed without mm -hmm. you. Um, you guys were everything to Canadian mus musicians because you hit all the centers, i.e., Sault Ste. Marie, that most people ignored. And so it meant something to people like me who wanted to be in the music business to see a professional act. We didn't get guys like you playing. Yeah, no, it was it was a natural thing, right? It's it, it's just what you expect should happen, and it did with us because Donald K. Donald, the promoter, who was uh, representing us, and he was part of the management team at the same time, Terry Flood Management. He says, "Let's you know, let's let's just go to these small towns and let's bust them in and." Let's go across the country. Let's do this this tour. It's never been done, you know, like this. Let's do it. And we're going, yeah, let's do this. We went right from high school, doing high school uh, shows to, to touring across the Canada, Canada and doing that kind of thing with um, probably with um, On Record. Because the first album was called April Wine, came out in 71. And then On Record came out. I think it was On Record. About that time, we started, you know, leaving Montreal area and going across the country. It was either that or the very next record, but right in there somewhere. Yeah, because well, in that area, in that area, you had, of course, we mentioned uh, "Bad Side of the Moon," but you had a great song as well called "Drop Your Guns" that I loved. Yeah, Drop the, Your Guns. That, yeah, that, that was on the, in the middle with the guitar harmonies and. Yeah, that was. You know, in fact, I've been playing with April Ryan recently, do, do, uh, dedicating it to the people of Ukraine, the war over there. Drop your guns, Russia, and 
you know, piss off. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, so uh, that was on on record. Yeah, David Henman wrote that. Nice, nice video, by the way. Drop your guns. I, what, saw, you your, I saw your video that you did for the Ukraine. Oh, oh, okay. I mean, I did that real fast. You know, the whole thing with you with that is that I was watching like the rest of the world what was happening in the in the Ukraine. You know, and it was becoming more horrific and more horrific. And I never write about politics. Mm-hmm. And I never write about religion. I leave them alone. Mm-hmm. And so I sat on my hands for, for weeks watching this in my house and just like so heartbroken. And then I said, oh, to hell with this. I'm going to write something. Because, I mean, that's what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what folk music is about. And folklore, passing, you know, things on and, and all of that. So I said, I'll write something. So Tuesday, I woke up about a month ago, Tuesday, and I said, I'm going to write a song. It was done the next day. It was in the studio Wednesday. It was in the studio Friday. I did the video real, very quickly over the weekend. It was out the next week. And it's got a lot. I mean, I'm headlining a Ukraine function tomorrow night. I'm working with the Ukraine Canadian Congress, the president, actually. And I'm doing interviews constantly around this whole thing with Ukraine, which has been wonderful because, you know, it, it just to inspire somebody to open their wallet, because that's all we can do from here. Mm-hmm. And I did it not because it was any kind of career move. It was not about me at all. I never thought about it for a minute. This is just how I felt about what was going on there. And so uh, I'm glad you liked the video, I guess. Yeah, no, I was just, I, I found it touching and, and, and of course, uh, important. You know, it's just important. And uh, it's nice to see that you doing that. I know, it, I, I knew, I felt that you were, you were doing something that was generally away from what you, your norm. And it was nice to well, see. Well, if I may just talk a minute about it, not just that anymore, but the thing is, that is the last song that's on an album called Long Pants. Long Pants is a songwriter's album that I started 42 years ago, Mm -hmm. and I never finished because it didn't fit anywhere. Okay. I say 42 years because my daughter, I have one daughter, and she's 42, and I came home from the hospital in the wee hours of the morning, the, the morning she was born, and I walked into my studio at home. I wrote and recorded the song on a cassette, a little cassette, which I still have. I might even be able to put my hands on it if it gave me 30 seconds. I think it's on the desk because for a reason. And anyway, I still have it. The tape's all worn and everything else. And um, I recorded it maybe four or five months ago for this record, this new record. And uh, every note and every word is exactly the same as when I wrote it 42 years ago, at two o'clock in the morning. Wow. nothing changed nothing wow. changed i got it right the first time period <laughs> you know and my family's been saying like for decades like miles what you know dad why don't you why don't you record this song it's so beautiful but i said i don't have a vehicle for it i can't put that on an april wine album i don't put that on my blues records i can't do it but i finally been able to do it and i've got the song about ukraine i've got a song that i'm doing a video for uh two weeks down in the, with the Mi'kmaq reservation with the natives down there uh, the indigenous people there in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, and it's about missing and murdered indigenous women mm. in North America, right? Very important to me because my my partner, my life partner, woman of my love, love of my life is native. So, and when she's hurt and crying and everything else, it, it affects me. When I hear how they're treating her children, they're hurting, they're doing the same to my children because of our relationship. So that's why I write about that. And um and uh, um, uh, Jackson, Tom Jackson, you know, Tom Jackson, yes. most famous, probably, yeah. along with Jay Silverheels from Tonto and the Long Ranger yeah. and, and a couple of others. He's right there as a singer. And he's a he's a he's a, he's a wonderful man. Uh, and he has a beautiful voice, wonderful voice, deep voice, rich and, and resident. So I got a hold of him and I told him what this was about. And I said, I got a section in the middle that I'd like you to do. Now, I wrote lyrics. These are all the lyrics. You can use these, or I would prefer you write your own, you know, and he did, and they're beautiful. He nailed it, and so he's on it, and uh, and the government's involved, too, the local government, and one of the one of the people involved is also um, right now in, up in Ottawa in Parliament, but anyway, so it's an important song, and it's on this. My new record is called Long Pants. It comes out June 23rd on my birthday. So it's got Ukraine, it's got Darling, Where Are You? But the Missing and Murdered. And then it has a song about the, all the children, the unmarked, unmarked, gra- unmarked graves that were discovered because of their Catholic residential schools in the last almost 100 years from the beginning. They were on so long. 
And the sad part, and the sad part is that it's it's still got so much further to go. Oh yeah, oh, it's, oh, 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 it's, oh, oh, it's oh, heartbreaking. Yeah. All of these issues have so much further to go. And Ukraine people are four, over four million displaced people. How long do you think that's going to go on? Yeah. Years, years. They have no money, they have no food, they have no job, they got no medicine, they got nothing, they got nothing. Four million. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and so the one about the unmarked graves is called uh, "Some of These Children They Never Grew Up," and and I released that, and that got, and that's, that has a video with it if folks want to see it. All of three songs, uh, all, two do. The third, "Darling, Where Are You," is going to be done in two weeks. But you know, in that respect, the album is unique to me, and it's a songwriter's, and, and it's important. And already, I know that uh, the Ukraine leader is up for award, a, a big award, and they they say I. You know, I should come. I should go to the ceremony because it looks real good. So I don't know, you know, about that, but we'll see. But anyway, and I got a song about my children and everything else. And I got a song about um, a, a su assisted suicide on this record. How does that fit on an April Wine record? It just doesn't. Yeah. But I was, I was, I was with Dan Hill. If I can, if I can. Sure. I was with Dan Hill. Sometimes when we touch the honesties, too yeah, much. Of course, you know, yeah. Biggest yeah. song on the planet. At one point, I remember I was in Hawaii at the time, and all I heard all day long was this song. So anyway, I did a songwriter story circle with him three years ago, and he tells the story of his mother, at the age of ninety, decides to go to Europe and end her life. She's ninety years old. Um, she's white. She was married to a, a black man through very turbulent times in, in, in terms of racial um, troubles around that. Uh, and of course, they had a Daniel, who's been very successful as a songwriter and, and, and still sings and writes. And his brother, I can't think of his name right now, he wrote a very important book called Book of Negroes. And actually had a TV series for a while. So, and, and, and one of his parents, I don't know if it was her or his father, as the Order of Canada. I mean, they're really educated, they're overachievers, yeah. So he's telling the story at the songwriter's circle. I'm listening to him. And I said to him after we had done, we're not very good friends, actually. I didn't know him at all for years, but uh, he called me the other day about something. So anyway, I, I went home and I, I thought about this because I believe in assisted suicide. I just do. I'm one of those that does, you know? Mm -hmm. And the quality is so bad, you should be able to leave uh, when you want. And so I wrote this song. It's the last two minutes and 14 seconds of someone's life. And it's just me and a guitar. And it's called electric guitar. And it's called um, I Leave Today. And, uh, and, I, and I said it to him and I said, are you okay with this? And he said, I love it, absolutely. So it's on this album as well. I have a young boy, a young boy, my youngest, he's not that young anymore, he's 26 now, but he was, he was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of six. Mm. And that's, that's a horrible disease. I, I'm diabetic type one too. I have insulin every day of my life. And so does he. And so I wrote a song for the JDRF and for my son about juvenile diabetes, JDRF being the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, right. which they embraced immediately. I've already done this song live with them, but now it's on a record that they've been waiting for, you know? And so it's an important record. It's an important it really record is. to me because I finally get all of these things out and, and as a solo record, you know, and it's called Long Pants and Long Pants meaning yeah, it's I was going to ask you. It's adult matter here. This is adult adult subjects. Like kids wear short pants, adults oh. wear long pants. Oh, I see. So it's it's uh, it's called long pants, and uh, comes out June twenty third on my birthday. Oh, so for you, that, yeah. That, that, it seems like you you really you really swung into just making your statements now. You know? Well, in April Wine, you know, you know, when you're doing rock records, you're it's, you're singing more about hot hot chicks, you know, and fast yeah. cars and stuff, you know, which is great. I don't regret those times, you know, no. and love songs. I mean, I love, I write love songs more than most, you know, but um, yeah, more important things to say now. Wow. That's, yeah. that's, that's pretty heady stuff. I wasn't expecting to go there. That's great. I'm, oh, I'm glad you, I'm and, glad and, you and allowed I, me. And oh, I'm, I'm proud of you. I think that's an amazing thing. Okay. You know, I, and uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's far cry from when I first heard it could have been a lady on the radio. Yeah, or, or slow poke. Yeah, it's a long oh, way. Slow from... <laughs> poke. Yeah, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had to get permission from Jimmy Dean. Jimmy Dean sausages, Big Bad John. Oh. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. 
Okay, well, there's a song way back in the 60s, a kind of a crossover where he talks. It's called Big Bad John. I remember that one, yeah. Yeah, Big Bad John. Okay, you know the yeah. song. Yeah. Well, well, my song is the same music, except fun lyrics, ridiculous lyrics. So I contacted Jimmy Dean, uh, and I said, do you mind if I sing these lyrics to your song? And you know what he said to me? He said, sure. Wish I could do a good Southern accent. Here's the thick one. He says, sure, son, but you don't get any money. And I said, I don't care about the money. He said, all right. I think it's funny as heck. You do it. So I did it. <laughs> that, was, that was a long time ago. So anyway, yeah. So it, it's very different. You could have been a lady. It was on, on, our, on, on our second record. That was a long time right. ago. Right. Now, was that, is that the same album that had Drop Your Guns and Bad Side of the Moon? No. No, they That's, were on the, those. Those on the third the next. Okay. Yeah, they would have been on on the next one because the very first one, the only song that we did had anything that did anything off that album, and it's still requested. It was very it was good for radio. It was called Fast Train. That was off the first one, and then the second one, you could have been a lady, and then the next one, it dropped your guns, mm -hmm. and uh, the other one you mentioned, Bad Side of the Moon. Did you mentioned uh, Bad Side of the Moon. Yeah, the Elton John. Yeah, a, yeah. and then there was a, a there was a song. I didn't write those songs. I wrote Fast Train, but I didn't write those two songs. One was, you know, um, what was the, you could have been lady was um, You Sexy Thing. What are they? You Sexy oh. Thing. Oh, Hot Chocolate? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that's a Hot Chocolate song. It could have been a lady was? Yes, sir. Wow. I didn't realize Hot Chocolate was around that long. Yeah. I thought they were like late 70s. Yeah. That was a hot chocolate. That was a hit in England for them. Oh, they probably never crossed the Atlantic until then. I mean, that's what it was. And our producer, Ralph Murphy, would go to Europe and he would find these songs. And so he found, you could have been a lady, he found Bad Side of the Moon, and he's, I'm on fire for you. He, he brought those to the band. Ah, I see. And also, Weeping Widow. No, yes, those four songs. Yeah, those four. Well, Over, the, the, that runs, a, that runs kind of a parallel with the Johnny Kidd and the Pirates shaking all over thing for the Guess Who. Yeah, I, I remember that story. Yeah, because yeah. 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 that was a big hit in England, but it was never over here. And they, yeah. they picked it up. Everybody thought it was their song, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, it happens. Happens more than we know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's like the same thing. I mean, that I'm on fire for you. To me, that's your song. Yeah, I know. I know in my in my heart, you didn't write it, but to me, it's your song. You know, yeah, you know I, I, yeah. We made it our own, and people, especially if you only know it by one artist, you just assume you know it's theirs. They own it. Of Nobody course. else. But yeah. yeah, it's like I never heard Matchbox by Carl Perkins. I heard it by the Beatles. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. <laughs> Blues weight shoes, exactly the same thing. You know. So who who? who who were your guys? Like, I mean, I, I was a Beatle freak. I still am, you know, I, I, I must confess. But so who are you, your guys? Like the, the people you really, that really got you wanted to be who you are. Well, the, I'm a Beatle baby like you, I guess. I, I, I don't know how old you are, but when they came out, I was just at that right age, you know, grew my hair long, had the Beatle boots. Our band tried to look kind of like the Beatles, that kind of thing. And, uh, and so major influence and in like a, a lot of the world and musicians, we realized we could do it all. Because before you that know, was all the Bobby acts. <laughs> I talk about, that's how I refer to them in my, in my memoir, just between you and me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all, all the Bobbies. And of course we had our own Bobby with Bobby Gratola. Yes. Yes. Which passed away, uh, passed away what, two years ago now? Yeah. Not very long ago. No, he was finally inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame and he'd been dead by six months. It's just shameful. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, yeah. Kind of, got a, Canada's got a funny star system, I got to tell you. But anyway, um, you know, country music at first influenced me. I mean, everybody did. I mean, I was just, it was music for me. You know, my mother died when I was 11 and I had already been very attracted to music. And really, I watched Elvis in 1956 on Ed Sullivan. I, I was there in front of a black and white TV, like mesmerized as a very young fella. Uh, when my mother died, when I was 11 uh, in 1959, I turned to music big time. That was my, that's my place. That's where I went. And um, that's when I became really serious. So I've always listened to whatever's going on. A lot of country hits, man. I could play them all. That's how I learned to play guitar. Listen to, you know, Tennessee Ernie Ford or, 
or, or, or, or, or, or all of those great, great artists from back in the day, you know, El Paso and all those songs. Um, you know? Marty Robbins is amazing. Marty Robbins, like unbelievable. Unbelievably good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, incredible. Died too young, you know, cancer. Yeah. But anyway, anyway. And, and so and, many and, albums. That guy had a lot of output. Holy smokes. Yeah, yeah. We play Marty Robbins a lot of that. And car, when we go on road trips and stuff, we have his CDs, the greatest of and all that. We're big fans, my partner and I. So anyway, um, and then the Beatles, of course, with the Brit British invasion, then I loved everything British, everything from the Rolling Stones to the Beatles to everybody else, Dave Clark Five to you name it. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, in, into Zeppelin, things started getting heavy, albums started being made, and, yeah. you know, and back then uh, I was subjected to everybody. Everybody was just, I was like a sponge, you know, loving it, loving it. Yeah, there's a, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I, I've been a stem collector for quite a few years. I have the stems of a lot of stuff, and uh, so it's like stems from Abbey Road, and I got the stems from the Led Zeppelin too. Obviously. What does stems mean? What do you mean? Um, basically, just the, the uh, individual tracks, uh, of like the the multi tracks of the albums. Oh, so I've got oh. most generally uh, the stems means they're sort of so um, you won't have all six of, or let's say eight or 10 of the drum tracks, but you'll have them mixed down to like four to six, maybe something like that. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're submixed into stems. Uh, okay, so, what what format? Uh, whatever you want, I got waves, wave files. They're oh, all wave waves. Files. Or, okay, wave files, yeah. Uh, or yeah, I, I've got a way of, uh, uh, what, what do you call it? extracting them into what I need. <laughs> so oh. I, I could, I got to be. Are they not? Are they not for sale for anybody that wants to buy these things? Are they... Oh no, because it's it's it's. It, I mean, it, it's good for guys like me and you to trade. You know, or, or, or just I could. Oh, I, if, uh, you want, if you want to hear something, I could send it to you. You know. No, no, I didn't. Want, I didn't mean you specifically. I mean, just can people just buy them if they want? Something? No, I, it actually it actually started a friend of mine. Well, Jim Valance, you know Jim. Yeah. Uh, and and so Jim and I are like old friends and Beatle freaks from way back, and and so he he sent me the Sergeant Pepper four songs from Sgt. Pepper. I'm like, where the hell did you get these? He says, well, I can't really tell you. Well, then I started hearing from other people and I started going on the net. I was finding all this stuff. So now I'm sending him things and, and going back and forth. We're having a riot with it, you know? Oh, because that's, there's that's, people that's cool. That collect them, yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. But um, now I got I to gotta ask you something and, and it has to do with the chronological uh, member changes in the band. When you, when, I mean, April Wine first started, when you first broke, Let's say when you first broke, uh, there was was it was it two brothers in the band with you? Yeah, that was uh, David and Richie Henman. Yeah. Okay, yeah, and, they, and now did you not just did you not mention David earlier saying he wrote a song that you just did? Yeah, or? drop your guns. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So so the, the two Henman brothers, what did they play? Well, David was a guitar player, did some singing, and Richie was the drummer. Okay, and who was the bass player at that point? Their cousin Jim Henman. Oh wow! David, so that, David, David Edmund, Richie Edmund, brothers, cousin Jim Edmund. Wow! And myself, and then, the four. Of and then and you, and so that lasted for what? Three, four albums? It lasted to the middle of uh, the whole was going crazy. Whole electric electric jewels. Electric jewels. That makes sense. Okay. And uh, and I wasn't happy. Uh, I wasn't happy, and so um, I replaced uh, Richie with uh, jerry mercer uh, from mash mccann yeah from mash mccann and when i when i contacted him he was in new york with um uh the master of the the master of the telecaster um uh, the blues guy there uh, oh buchanan yeah roy, roy he played with roy really he was he was with roy at that time he was doing a tour and a little bit of recording wow so so i got a hold of him and i said i need a drummer for april wine you know to go where i want to go musically the thing about Richie, and this is all in my book. I mean, you know, and and and, and Richie and I are still in, in, in contact. Like, he wasn't a serious musician. I mean, I am still. Mm -hmm. That's what I live for. I live for music, and every day it's about music. Every day, I get up and and, and my, I'm wrapped up in a guitar for the time I'm having my first coffee. That's almost every day. So. I mean, I've got I've got albums written and backed up. I mean, I got my next blues albums all written. Anyway, I'm getting off track. So he was he didn't he's not like that, and I knew he wasn't like that. So I had to replace him, and um, and he got into a uh, into a job and spent the rest of his life doing something that he was excellent at, very very good at. And so 
he, he was in the right place. Yeah. So, and, and so no, Richie, no, no harm done. No harm done. So then, so Jerry joined me, an incredible drummer. Uh, you know, and one, one of the greatest I've ever seen and heard. Yeah, yeah. Like people talk about Neil Peart, they talk about Jerry Mercer in the same breath. Yeah, you know? I agree. I agree. And uh, and of course, Jerry's still alive. He just celebrated a birthday, what, three weeks ago, I think. And so I'm 74. Uh, I'm 73 right now, but I'm 74 in June on my birthday on the 23rd. And we, he's nine years older. He's actually 10 years old, older for a couple of months because his birthday's in May, mine's in June. So, but he's I, still around. He doesn't play anymore. But, you know, he just to so show fans out there that you know that he's, he's still alive and he's well. You know? I was going to ask you, and I, I assumed he was probably well, uh, but just retired. My, my, one of the things that surprised me about Jerry, though, was how late he came to the game playing drums. Why do you say that? I remember reading in a book some, somewhere where he didn't start playing until he was in his 20s. Oh, it could be. I, I don't know about that. I know he was always, uh, he loved music as well. He sang in the choir and all kinds of things like that, like I did. Uh, and Jerry has a very good ear musically. Like we did a version of 21st Century Schizoid Man, a guitar version of a song that belonged to King Crimson way back right. in the day. I think, it was, I think it was Harder, Faster. And I had always wanted to do it since because I got that first Court of the Crimson King by them. And the song was there. And I said, I really want to do this one day. So years go by. And then I said, okay. But it was Mercer, some of the really complicated, some of that stuff that's syncopated and really, he worked it on the piano in the studio because we were going like, no, what's it doing there anyway, you know? And it was Jerry, he has a good ear. Wow. So he would sit down and figure, no, this is it here. There's, okay, there's the harmony on another song. He, he, he was good that way. That came from his church upbringing. Well, you know, I, it's funny you say that about him being musical, because I played a version of the other day when I was knowing you were going to be on the show. And I remember I looked at I was listening to the live album that came out back then. And, and he had that little cut of his own called Good Fibes. Right? Yeah, he did a drum solo. I said, Jerry, give it a name. You'll get yeah. some royalties. <laughs> but it was what I'm going to say is it was so musical what he was playing. Those drums were playing melodies. It wasn't just chops. You know, it was it is, like that's what made his drum solo so freaking good, not just the show. Absolute, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. And the drums are called vibes too. You know, the drums vibes, are called yeah, yeah, vibes, yeah. yeah, good vibes. So, uh, no, I mean, I can't listen to a drum solo. I hear people do drum solos on the road with touring something, get rings into it, and they're just like, you know, yeah. it ne but network, Jerry, time, network time killers. But Jerry, my God, it all has form and it develops and does this and it does that and syncopations and it's just like. What, it's a piece of music. It's a, it's beautiful, and he did it like no other. I'm sure there are other drummers that had incredible drum solos too, but he was definitely one of them, wasn't he? I did enjoy Mick Fleetwood's drum solo with Fleetwood Mac because it brought him out. You could he, he can be quite a comedian, so he's almost he was. It almost made him a front man for that piece. You know, it wasn't mm -hmm. so much what he played; it was how he played it and the way he dealed with the uh, he dealt with the audience and brought them into it. Okay, which was I don't fun. know. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. But yeah. no, Jerry, by far best drum solo ever in the history of my life. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and at the same time, when David left the band in the, in the, in the middle of Electric Jewels, uh, I brought in Gary Moffat, who we had known. He lived in Montreal and, uh, and he was in a band called Pops Merrily. Oh, okay. And he's a student of, uh, of the American Songbook. So he... There's solos on April Wine Records that are just absolutely outstanding. And, and the best of them are him. You know, uh, not that Brian Greenway and myself didn't play decent solos, but Gary's were spectacular. Uh, if you listen to, I mean, I don't know if, you, if people watching this would know the songs or not, but a song like, uh, well, You Won't Dance With Me, mm -hmm. actually, is very orchestrated with harmonies and they divide and they do this whole thing. And um, uh, um, Mama Lay, which is a very Caribbean driven kind of thing about this voodoo lady, the solo in that. So many times, you know, what would happen is I'd have a song and I'd say, you know, Gary, you want to, you want to do the solo on this one? He goes, sure. So he'd take it home and he'd work it all out. And then he would come back to the studio and with two versions. And we would sit there and listen to his two versions that were complete with harmonies and counter melodies and like this whole incredible thing. And we just be blown away. So yeah, let's do that. You know, it's remarkable. What's he doing now? 
I think he plays a little bit. I, I know he plays with Brian Greenway sometimes in a, in, in a band. Uh, oh, right. The, I the, saw that a few years ago. That the blues, the blues bus. Together. Yeah, the blues oh, yeah. bus. Yeah. It's kind of a, you know, you know, club thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know cool. what else he, I don't know what else he does. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. But he's still alive and well, as far as I know. Yeah. 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 And uh, and you guys are, are are you touring right now or yet? Have you toured? Yeah, we, we yeah yet? we're yeah, we've just started. We did two shows late last year, and we're doing uh, we're we're touring. We had about fifteen shows this year. We might do a few more. I refuse to go to the states because usually we tour. Half of our touring is here, and about half of it's in the U.S. Right, uh, but since COVID, I don't I have no interest in leaving Canada, mm. and I've only been interested in touring in Canada very recently. So. Right. doing some shows you know yeah it's it's it, you got to be careful you you got to look out to make sure you're not uh, being part of the problem you yeah know? you know and, and it's and, and some people don't seem to give a darn but you know again at my age and with my diabetes i have to be a little more careful than some perhaps you know oh my wife is a cancer survivor oh yeah um, you know of five years and so she's got a good compromised lung from uh, radiation that she has to be super careful doesn't absolutely. she absolutely absolutely yeah so uh, we we actually both did get COVID over christmas but it was omicron, oh. omicron which didn't affect our lungs which is good because i caught it first and i think i actually got it from a grocery store i was masked up i was sanitized but but we didn't know that omicron was the one that could actually uh, you can catch it with touch. Mm. Whereas the Delta and the one before that, they realized the touch wasn't as important. So everybody started getting lazy on the touch stuff. And that's when Omicron got in. Okay. And okay. It, it had crossed, it had cross pollinated as you, as it were with a common cold, which is why it was easily infecting everybody. Yeah. But everybody, it was, but it was a lesser, a lesser. Yeah, of intensity. course. Of course. Yeah. yeah Cause today you've had all your shots and, uh, you know, we we still do what, today what we did at the beginning when it became a real pandemic because we everything comes in this house is washed down. Mm -hmm. Everything from the grocery store, everything is wiped down. Everything. So I mean, at, everything at is home, clean. is it just you and your wife now? Yeah, just 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 Kim and I. Yeah. 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 Any pets? No, I don't have time for that anymore. I wish I'd love a dog, but no. Yeah. Well, for the first time in my life, I actually have a dog. Because yeah. I didn't allow myself to have a dog before because nobody would look after it. But now I've got a, a lovely wife who's a dog freak and I've turned into the, the world's biggest doggy daddy. So, yeah, um, yeah. But, but at least I know when I go on the road now that the dog is well. The dog's after. OK. Yeah. yeah, that that was my main concern, you know, because uh, I don't want to ever bring an animal into a home where it's not going to get the utmost uh, love and care all the time. Yeah, my dogs, I had two. I mean, when beside, as an adult, one is uh, both of them are golden. Both are oh, beautiful dogs. And my first one, uh, Archie, uh, loved Archie. It. Archie, yeah, Archie. And my recording studio is called Mound Sound. It's in my book, Mound Sound, because he would leave all these little presents outside as people trying to make their way to my studio. <laughs> was, oh, watch where you walk, watch where you walk, watch where Archie's been out here. Uh, so they called it Mound Sound. Uh, and Archie would sit at my feet. I don't care how loud it was. April wine, Marshall scream and everything else. He'd sit, she, he'd sit at my feet, just like this. That's where she wanted to be with me. Yeah. And when it's time to shut the studio down, I'd shut her out on clean up and everything. And she'd be there. And then, okay, upstairs, Archie, let's go. We'd go up together. We'd come back down together the next day. I mean, I love that dog. Yeah. And she lived as long as they lived. They lived for about 14 years. And then, you know, she died. That is, that is a long time for gold. That's a long time. She had hit display. She, you know, the dogs are, are and they had ear infections because they get the hanging ears and stuff. But she was a beautiful dog and I have a beautiful picture of Archie. And then when he, when he died, I got another one called Copper and she lived about as long. I love the dog, but I, I just, they take too much time and I can't give them that time now. Plus, they'll probably outlive me at this point. So I don't know what. <laughs> who knows they'll be looking after me one day <laughs> let's take yeah, Lyle, let's take well, miles for a walk yeah, was, <laughs> <laughs> take take miles for a drag yeah let's go drag miles around the block yeah <laughs> i was gonna say uh yeah well jenny is normally in here with me but i she's upstairs with mummy right now but she, she's usually in because this is my studio as well and uh so she's usually in here with me no matter what i'm doing she just lays beside me and just enjoys it you know it's yeah, yeah, that's her. cool. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's a we, she, she's a rescue. We got her uh, December of twenty because we had to put our dog, uh, my our dog Bella, which was my wife's dog for fifteen years, and uh, De Bella developed uh, lymphoma, 
And mm. uh, so we had to, we ended up having to put her down. And we had discussed that when it came time to put Bella down, because we knew she was getting older, that we wouldn't get another dog because I wanted Kelly to travel with me and not to worry about a dog. Yeah. Well, then, of course, it's COVID and stuff. And Kelly is going to bed crying almost every night because of Bella. It's like that was her whole life. You know, she she loved that dog. The dog loved her. And so she started looking at dogs, uh, rescues from Mexico. And so right. we, uh, we, we adopted Jenny on the 19th of December of uh, 20. And, um, and, and, and so last Christmas, we bought each other the Embark uh, DNA test, which is apparently the best thing to find out what she was, because we couldn't figure out what the deal was. They found her on the streets of Mexico, skinny as a rail, by the way. Find out what, that she's like this far away from a purebred Cocker Spaniel. Mm. So that, you know, she was obviously bred for money for many, many years. And then once once she became too old to breed, they just out in the street, you go. And there she was running in and out of cars and skinny as a rail. And it's, it's yeah, we, we we saved a dog like that in uh, Punta Cana, a place down in Punta Cana on the beach. And she looked like she was right out of a, a Disney movie. Just beautiful, beautiful dog. But, you know, her fear, her claws were all big and twisted and homeless. Aww. and. Aww living off scrap so we were eventually able to get her adopted here in canada somebody in the west coast there's a trail just outside our backyard and there's this guy that's walking these two dogs one of them is a very healthy looking sort of german shepherd sort of cross and the other one is like you say like a you know a, a golden but it's yeah. it's it's basically it's walking and its back legs are either dragging or hopping behind it and so I walked up, I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, it's the rescue from uh, Puerto Vallarta. And we don't know what they did with this dog. Oh, so OK. Great. Yeah, it's another one from uh, the Yeah, crib. and it's, it's, it's got marks on its feet. I don't know what the hell it was. It's terrible. He says it's, it's, he says it's actually much better now. He said when we first got her, she was in a wheelchair. She, she yeah, couldn't do anything. Yeah, yeah. A lot of stories like that. It's really, really sad because you see them when you go on vacation. Cuba, places like that, you see them. And they just sort of the side of the road rooting through, through garbage. Anyway, uh, I know we've been talking a long time. And you've got a shitload of editing to do. No, Is no, any, it's, it's all good. Anything else you wanted to, to I, touch I on? I do. I have one more thing to ask of you. I, I've, I've got some random pictures here, and I want you to comment on them. Can you do that for me? I'll try. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to share the screen here, and we'll see. There we go. You see that? Yeah. So, I, so you on the left. And that's Steve Lang beside you. Yeah. And then Gary Moffitt. Gary, Mo Gary Moffitt, Brian Greenway, Brian Greenway. And, and we can't and see all Gary of Mercer. Jerry, Gary Mercer. So, so I that's that's gotta be 77, I'm thinking. That's harder, faster. Um, period. That's in Germany. We were touring in Germany and they decided to do a, a little photo one afternoon. Uh, I will say the only thing when I look at that, one thing I can't help but smile about is you see the shirt that I'm wearing, that white thing with the flowers. Yeah. I still have it. Really? I oh, have it. And 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 I, I couldn't even begin to put it on. <laughs> you and me both, brother. <laughs> no, it's not just the fact, I don't know what happened to it. It's not just the fact that I'm so much bigger. It's just, I don't know why it's so small. But anyway, I still have that. I still have that. Yeah. That's cool. I you know, yeah. I, I got rid of all those clothes from back in the day, and I really wish I had still had them at the very least, just because it's such a great thing to touch, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't have too many of them. I just happen to have that. Anyway, yeah. And next one. Here we go. Remember that? Yeah, that was taken up at uh, where the nickel is. What's the name of the, nic the nickel? Sud uh, Sudbury. 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 You know, it's all like the moon up there. It's all rocky and treeless, pretty much. Yeah. At that, at that time, it looks very different today. But that yeah. was taken in Sudbury. And uh, so, and that's uh, pro obviously the promo for Drop Your Guns. So. Drop Your Guns. I'm on the left. That's Jim Clench next to me, standing back a bit. That's Richie Henman, the drummer, and David, who wrote the song in the far right, looking at the picture. Yeah. Oh, cool. And uh, this here, that's sort of your new, that's your new promo, basically, for uh, the Ukrainian uh, epic you just did. Yeah, that's that. That's just a picture. I mean, you know, like I told you, I, I wrote it, you know, over, you know, in two days into the studio, recorded it right away, did the video right away. So uh, it was all very on the fly and I didn't know the words. I'm wearing headphones like I am right now, looking at the words as I try to, you know, kind of sing along with it. And, uh, and you know, I look of just of interest and maybe your guitar folks out there, see that Gretsch. 
Mm -hmm. that, that Gretsch uh, is the first. I bought that Gretsch and I, I, I liked it so much that I now have a collection. You can't see. I know Randy Backman is the biggest collection of Gretsch guitars. He did. But I, but I do have, I have, yes, he sold them. I have five Gretsches now and, 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 uh, and uh, the collectible ones are really nice ones. You know, I love guitars. Anyway. Yeah, I know. There's something about them. I don't. Maybe it's the shape of them. They're like a woman or something. And they have something that's... else. Something else I'd like to say. You see the microphone? I just realized it. That's it. That's a no, uh, that's a new a Neumann uh, eighty seven. Oh, that is U eighty seven. Okay. I bought I bought that years and years and years ago. It was slightly modified uh, for me, and I've been singing in it. April Wine Records, Blues Records. I mean, I've been singing everything through that microphone. When it's done, it comes home with me, and when it's ready to sing, I take it back. The exactly. same one, the same one, yeah. Well, I'll try to buy one new these days. Try to buy one used these days. Yeah, yeah. One like that would be very, very expensive today. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you're talking about uh, you getting your guitar back and Randy, of course, what happened with him getting his guitar back from that guy in Japan after yeah. all these years. That's what started the whole Gretsch thing was that he had his Gretsch stolen, which is the one he bought around the same time and Neil Young and him bought them at guess in Winnipeg. And, um, and so he loved that guitar. He never played it on stage, but he used it for a lot of recordings. That's his Gretsch sure. taking care of business, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah it's really uh, heartbreaking to lose something like that. Yeah, and back back in those days, it was stolen. And so he wrote every pawn shop and music store across Canada and all over the place. And they would send him faxes. I would say, hey, we got this Gretsch in. We don't know if it's yours, but we heard you're missing. He'd get a picture of it and he'd go, okay, well, you know, that that's not mine but how much do you want for it and so he'd strike a deal and he'd get that gretch then it was this gretch this gretch well that kept yeah they're so beautiful that once you start it's like you get addicted to them because they're like no other guitar and and, and most of us didn't really think of getting a gretch the rockers for one thing it was on the wall above and away from everything else you could never put your hands on a gretch they were like the rolls royce yeah with especially the white falcons yeah, well, the White Falcons and, and the other great guitars. And uh, anyway. Yeah, but anyway, so he, he ended up amassing pretty much every Gretsch made. In fact, I think he did, some of them in two or three. So, of course, he had made friends with Fred Gretsch over the years. And yeah, so, yeah, and I, know, so, I, know, I know that, yeah. And then Fred Gretsch was, had just gotten the rights back. I think for a while, the, the manufacturing of Gretsch was gone to a, a, an offshore concrete or something. And he, so he, he had got it back. But in the meantime, all of his templates were burned in a fire. So he, knowing that Randy had all these Gretches, he says, can I borrow your Gretches to make new templates because I want to start manufacturing again? Mm -hmm. And Randy says, OK, I'll do that as long as you give me all the prototypes. So he doubled his collection, new and old, on everything. Oh, he's a smart, smart move. Yeah. I guess, you know, if you want them, yeah, if you want to hang on to them. It's funny, you know, I find with about, I got about 100 guitars and I feel very strongly now that I don't need a hundred guitars, <laughs> you know, and, and is this, they, they never see the light of day. They're all put away. I mean, Fury guitars for the guitar collectors again, Fury guitars are made by Glenn McDougall and Fury yeah. guitars are the oldest Canadian manufacturer of guitars. Ever. They were out of Saskatoon, weren't they? They were. And he started in 1962 and he just passed away. What it's been, she's longer than I think, I think maybe four years ago now. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And he was a really good man. I visited him many times. Matter of fact, when I heard that he was dying, I, I was on a plane the next day and I went out to be with him. But anyway, I have a collection of his guitars. And, and like how many, and, and it's great because I, I take them out and I look at them and I go, oh my God, it's made so beautifully. They're, they're so well known in Nashville and they're so known in all of these great places by session players, but nobody in Canada really knows them. We look beyond them. All we wanted to see the Gibson. We want to see the Strat. We didn't want to look at this Canadian made guitar called uh, Fury, but they're better than most guitars manufactured anywhere. Oh, so many times I, I would forsake the trainer amps for other things. And now I would give my left whatever for a trainer, you know, to because they're hard to get because they're worth a fortune because they were really well made amps. But we, yeah. we didn't we didn't respect them because they were Canadian. How stupid yeah, it, are we? You know? Yeah, because they were they were it, it's funny because I have I have a great one downstairs, an old one from the 70s, big heavy thing, and it works beautifully. It's got tremor, it's got reverb in it, and it's it just has a sound to it that's unique on its own. But I remember back when uh when uh, a trainer um what was this the first name? I, I tend to say Steve Trainer because I know Pete, Steve Pete Pete Pete, Pete yeah, Pete, Pete, yeah. So Pete got a hold of me. 
Maybe he got a hold of Bachman. I don't know. He got a hold of me years ago and wanted me to go to his to, to his shop and listen to his stuff and to see if I had any suggestions as a guitar, because he knew me for my guitar playing and so forth, and April Wine, of course. And so I remember one afternoon going to see him in Toronto, in Toronto area somewhere, I forget where it was, it was a very long time ago, in the 70s. Yeah, so it was nice to meet him and, uh, you know, I don't know. Well, I think they were based out of Yorkville, so maybe that's where it yeah, was. Yeah, Yorkville Sound, Yorkville, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good, good memory of uh, Pete Trainer. You know, and I have one of his one of his great ones downstairs. I think it's a really nice one. Just ahead, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tell me about this. Yeah, that's that is uh, not a good picture, and that's um, that's the first spiritual song that I ever wrote. It's on Long Pants as well, and uh, I did it with. I have an acoustic trio. We tour. Actually, we're coming and doing a tour up in Ontario um, uh, in June, and uh, and I play about. 20 shows, 25 shows since COVID down in the Atlantic provinces where I feel it's a little safer in our bubble. But anyway, we do this and it's a lot of fun. What's, and, the, pre what's the premise of this song? Uh, that's where I'm getting to that. So my, tr my trio does this John, uh, Glenn, uh, uh, this McCullen song, Jim McCullen song called Put Your Hand in the Hand. Right. And we did it on the Christmas Daddy show. And it was so well received that I said, you know what? People really like the spiritual songs. I want to see if I can write one my first ever. So I wrote a chorus and I went to my partner, Kim, who's very religious, should never know it. And I went to hear it. I said, honey, here's, what do you think of this? And by the time I finished the chorus, she was crying. And I said, I, I, I said, you like it? She goes, oh, it's, it's beautiful. And so I finished it and uh, I recorded it. And it was so funny. And this is the truth, folks. I was in the middle of writing this song right here with the last voice I hear be an angel. When I got a call from Los Angeles um, uh, from spirit, some, and, and they wanted me to be a judge in a spiritual song writing contest. <laughs> and I said to the, I said to the lady uh, in charge, I said, why in the world would you contact me? And she says, cause we like your songwriting. Are you interested? And I said, well, guess what? I'm trying to write my very first spiritual ever. I will do this. So I became a judge. And I and I finished the song. Serendipity. Wow. I know. And then I get all of these, you know, the song was so well received everywhere. And then one day I get a call from this, this, this magazine. It was set up. They wanted to talk to me. The Pope reads this one. This is the one the Pope would read. It's so straight and so religious, hardcore. It's been around for ever and i said oh my god can i handle this i said okay so we we had a nice interview you know and um uh people were really taken with the song i i, I think it's a really lovely song and people love it too and uh yeah it's my first spiritual this it's is a, a, it's a this great, is from the video it's a great title like that's an incredible title yeah yeah well that's the chorus line where the last voice i hear be an angel um saying take my hand and walk with me yeah. That's the short version of the chorus. Yeah, it, it's about reflection at this at a point in life. Again, why it's called long pants. This is adult right. stuff, you know. That's yeah. cool. And we we spoke about this before, but here's bringing up the uh, the picture. Yeah, there's the same shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. That's and there's there's my there's my melody maker. I got it back in exactly the same. I could have walked on stage. Not a damn thing had changed with that guitar. It was set up, played beautifully. All it was was a guy had it in his in his in his house and stand for people to talk about it. And you'll see there's a star on yep. the top corner. That's the only thing missing. Everything wow. else is is exactly the same. Uh, you can see the picture uh, where, where you know where I was younger, and uh, and the guitar is a little bit a bit newer. But I kept playing it and playing it. And you can see it's all worn down around the pickups right through that uh, that covering. But yeah, that's it. Is that's that the guitar I would have seen in Sault Ste. Marie back in the oh, day? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And are those P90s in it? What is what? What's the pickups? Well, you know what? I've never opened it up since they, since a decade ago that I put them in, but I think there's some kind of De DiMaggio's. Oh, I see. So they're not just, they're not the original pickups. No, I said to you that to you before when we talked about the guitar earlier uh, today. Uh, they're not the original. I, I, I really don't oh, think. Oh, right. Yeah, you did say you swapped out the pickups, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. There we go. That's an, another shot for the. Uh... Yeah, that's my Martin D45. That's that, Those are nice guitars. Yeah, no kidding. Love them.
And there's one of your new promo shots. Yeah, that's from my acoustic act that I do. Yeah, and and and, and it's funny because all the April wine hits that we've talked about, almost like ninety percent, all written on acoustic guitar. Hmm. And even Roller, I like to rock. Say hello, all written on acoustic guitar on on my nineteen forty seven something Southern Jumbo Gibson, I which like is to, here in the office. As a matter of fact, I like to rock. Must have been a lot of fun to make with the, you know the uh, day tripper and satisfaction licks and all that stuff at the end. That was that must have been fun to do. Yeah, that was a jam in the studio. Yeah, that was yeah. Now that I I took this picture because of that national because I knew I figured okay if you've got an old national guitar like that you've got to be a guitar lover and I remember the Goya so I went okay I got to talk guitars with this guy. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a lot of guitars. This one here is a, a forty um, five or something like that. Wow. Yeah, around there somewhere, and uh, you know you see where the jack is on the guitar. You oh have to yeah. On. Like a, like a mic uh, jack, you know, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is an absolutely stunningly beautiful guitar. You don't even really get to see the wood in this. It's just like unbelievably cool. Uh, and it gets played. The last time this was recorded, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I, re I released a blues album in 2018. Uh, my first ever. I just decided I'm going to write a blues album. So I, you know, being a song man, first and foremost, I wrote 12 songs and I called blues people in the States and Rick Derringer's on it. Um, I, I chose Rick. He's, we think of him as rock, of course, but he was so, we were doing a lot of work with the Winter Brothers and so forth. And, and all the who's who blues guys in Canada. And I did that and I was nominated for Blues Album of the Year. So it did really well. Internationally, nice. well, yeah, I won a number of awards with it. So then it was called Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues. And I have a song called Brand New Cardboard Belt. And that's the, all the slide through that whole song, because it plays through the whole song, was played on that guitar. It is gorgeous. Yeah, really nice. What's that cigar box guitar in the back? Oh, yeah, that's what it is. It's a, there's a, there's a fella uh, that makes those, and I've got two or three of his. And that, one has th that one has three strings, that one, I believe. Cool. Yeah, because I, I really got, so I released a second blues album called Miles Good and Friends of the Blues too, and it did equally as well. And so now, um, once I get long pants out of the way, then my third installment in the blues is called I Dream in Blue. And that'll be out this, uh, this summer. This here, okay. I just brought these up because it shows sort of chronological the hits over on the radio, which I thought was interesting. Right. Uh, don't, don't have much to say about that. It's just, it's nice to see all the songs that you've uh, been, had your hand in over the years. It's yeah, 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 yeah. So come in the band. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, yeah, it's cool. And uh, it goes on. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool, yeah. That's great. And I believe that's the last picture. It's once again from your, it's another angle the, from the same. Yeah, that's the acoustic, the acoustic show, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing something like this for Ukraine, uh, the Ukraine benefit tomorrow night or afternoon. Now, did you um I was gonna say, do you happen to remember where you got that national guitar? Do you remember the circumstances of when you how you got it? Oh, I don't. Oh, because the only guitar I've got of note, I've got I've got one really old lap steel, really old lap steel that a guy gave me because he was doing sessions here. And he he said, Hey, how about how about if I just give you this instead of paying for the session today? I'm like, cool, you know. But I've got a 1965 Baldwin Baby Bison, which I just love. Yeah, I know the guitar. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. And the reason I got it, actually, I bought it in Nashville. And the reason I bought it is because that's the very first electric guitar I ever played when I was a little kid. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even know who owned it. It's just my my brother happened to have it in his possession. And I remember picking up going, wow, because I remember I, I had my brother's K guitar with the strings were like an inch high up the neck. You know, it was $17 mm -hmm. K from Kmart. And it was like what, playing that that Baldwin guitar. I was like, oh, my God, it's like playing nothing, you know. And anyway, enough guitar talk. Yeah, I have uh, the very first guitar I ever owned. I still have. I still Is that, have. Oh, man, you're so lucky. Oh, yeah, oh, I, it, it, it disappeared too. You know, this this wasn't new, newsworthy, but it disappeared. I started dead. I said, "Here, Dad, I don't need this anymore." I left home. I, 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 you know, and I only got it back about ten years ago because one of his girlfriends had it. She said, "Oh, Frank wanted you to have this. He looked after it, and it showed up in a hotel in 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 in, in uh, Vancouver." The lady at the desk said, "I got some package for you." So I went on. I said, oh, my God, it's an old guitar case. Look at this, one of those old cardboard ones with string. I opened it up, and 
I said, that's my old guitar. This is Norma out of Japan. It's a cover of a, of, of a hummingbird, Gibson. Wow. I said, and there's a little note in it from dad. I said, oh my God, I haven't seen this in like 40 something years, just like that. So that's pretty cool. So I got yeah. it back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's a nice story too. No kidding. Well, anyway, Miles, I know I, I, I know this went on way longer than you expected, but boy, what a great chat. <laughs> it's been well, well, thank you. I enjoyed it as well. Yeah, yeah excellent. And, and th thanks for being on the show. And uh, I will uh, send you or your representation at the very least uh, a link to this when it's all ready to go. And uh, yeah, and thank you very much. I hope I get to see you again. I, maybe we'll meet each other in the Air Candle Lounge again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they're open again. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, they are. They, they, they always have those. been a bit. It was odd going in there over the past while because you you have to order from one of those little uh, Q codes. You know, you put your phone down. It's got a Q code. It gives you a menu and they bring you the food. Out oh, I know. I know. I know. Yeah. Uh, but Very there, was, bizarre. Uh, there was a time during COVID that I that I tried in a couple of cities. I went right there and they were closed. Mm. They were shut down for business. Yeah. It was like a year and a half or a year ago, something like that. Yeah, I don't think I did any traveling then. So yeah, you, you, yeah, I'm sure that's probably the way it was. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, I got to thank you again. It's been marvelous. I really appreciate it. Th thanks for taking me down uh, memory lane. You're a very important person to me, and I'm glad I got to tell you that. So. <laughs> it's nice of you to say all of that. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. All right. Well, you have yourself. The, uh, I know it's probably late out there. It's 2.30. It's where uh, I am. 6.30 where I am. Okay, great. Well, you, Take care. Have a great night, and we'll talk soon again. I I'm going to have some fresh lobsters. I got them right from the, oh, right, from the right from the fisherman. Is, I was standing on the dock as he was coming in with his boat loaded with lobster, and I was like, "Hey, Peter, the captain, like, can I get some lobsters?" So that's how I get my lobsters. We have a cottage. Uh, on, we have a cottage down in the ocean there in Muskegon Harbor, and and the dock. I can walk to the dock where the they come in with the lobster. So I'm having lobster tonight. Oh. Uh, cold cold atlantic lobster the best oh it's the best i i it's funny i uh, i had a uh i had a tour with brandy and one of our dates i had a few days off so i what oh i don't know what it was i was in sault ste marie in my hometown visiting and then we went out to the east coast for a couple of days and then there was another period off before we would continue on probably in saskatoon or maybe no i think we actually i think we continued in chicago but uh, i went so i went to Prince, uh, I was on Prince Edward Island and I ordered huge boxes of lobster and had them shipped with me to Sault Ste. Marie and had all these people over. I couldn't believe how many people in my hometown had never tasted lobster in their entire life. <laughs> so it was like this incredible thing. There was like 30 people eating lobster at this party. It was, <laughs> I felt like a hero. It was great. That must, must have been pretty noisy. I remember one time in Los Angeles, record label, big, big table, lots of people. And they brought in the biggest lobster I've ever seen in my life. It was a freak of nature. <laughs> it was big, it was big enough to serve like 15 people or something. Oh, and I remember at the time, I mean, maybe I'm not remembered correctly, but I know it was at least, it was at least a, I, I keep thinking it was $110 because I said, what back when, you know, back when that was a lot of money for a lobster, trust me. Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, we spent $110 on that guy. I said, wow, because it's enough to feed, give some, uh, some to everybody. And it was it was huge. It was huge. Yeah, back when you would have paid five for a lobster, let's say. Yeah, maybe Fair not even. Yeah. Right now, today, uh, well, I don't know exactly what they are, but it's over $10, $10 a pound easily. I, I don't know exactly how much. But I get them right for the fishermen cash. Here we go. And uh, that's one of the perks of, of being down here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's a wonderful yeah. place. All right. Well, take care. Have a great evening. Yeah. And we'll talk again soon. Yeah, say, say hi to Randy. Uh, I, I will. Yeah. I promise I will. I, I will I, be seeing him for a bit, but uh, I will tell him. I, I, I know somebody told me the other day because he has a, a vinyl show or some radio or something. I don't listen to the radio. But anyway, he said, um, he said, here's a song I wish I wrote. And he played Say Hello. Yeah. Oh, well, there you go. Well, because yep. it's because the guitar riff is awesome. That's why. Yeah, yeah. People like it. Yeah. All right. Take care. You too. All the best. Bye now. Bye bye. Thanks for joining us. Check out our many other episodes and vignettes for more great content. And please like, share, and subscribe, and become a member at socialenergypresents.com to access all our content and earn valuable energy points just for watching.